So for those who don't know, I grew up in Texas and only recently moved to Portland, Oregon around two years ago. Even though we've been dealing with our own winter weather, citywide power outages, grocery stores calling the cops so starving people aren't allowed to take food home that's being thrown away by the dumpster full, we'd need an entire video to dissect just how truly messed up that is. It pales in comparison to what my home state is currently suffering through. A little background first. We've known for decades now that climate change due to increased amounts of CO2 pollution in the atmosphere at the hands of big oil and politicians serving as their lackeys will cause increasing levels of destabilization in the worldwide climates. This has already led to more devastating wildfires like we saw in Oregon last summer, more intense snowstorms, hurricanes and flooding, and shifts in temperature and precipitation causing cascading effects like crop failures, the destruction of agricultural industries, rising oceans, and disasters we do not currently have the infrastructure for. The historic winter storm pummeling Texas right now was caused by polar air that typically spins around the North Pole, dipping like a wobbling top spilling straight down the central U.S. and into Texas. Because the Arctic has been warming so rapidly, that warm air is displacing the colder air and the weakening jet stream that typically helps to hold the cold air in place wasn't able to stem the tide. And it's been horrifying watching what's unfolding all across Texas right now. Nearly a week ago, snowstorms began raging from Amarillo to Galveston and even to Del Rio near the border. Reports of six inches or more of snow burying city after city began circulating and gridlock ensued since this state is in no way prepared to deal with disasters like this. Naturally, temperatures across the state plunged into the teens and single digits and some areas even dipping just below zero, causing unprecedented demand for electricity as millions of Texans try to heat their homes and stave off the deadly cold. The only issue is Texas's energy grid, called ERCOT, or the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, was intentionally built to only be able to supply a certain amount of electricity with no wiggle room whatsoever, which means that any situation that requires even a small boost of power will lead to blackouts for thousands, if not millions, like we're seeing right now. Now, why is this? For starters, given the state's secessionist mindset, it shouldn't surprise us that it built its own power grid separate from the rest of the U.S. In an article for the Texas Tribune, Kate Gilbraith wrote, The Texas interconnected system, which for a long time was actually operated by two distinct entities, one for northern Texas and one for southern Texas, had another priority, staying out of the reach of federal regulators. In 1935, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Federal Power Act, which charged the Federal Power Commission with overseeing interstate electricity sales. By not crossing state lines, Texas utilities avoided being subjected to federal rules. ERCOT was formed in 1970 and remains beyond the jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And because ERCOT services about 90% of the state and is disconnected from the rest of the country's power grid, if things go down, there is no one who can provide backup power and bring things back online. Not only that, but Governor Greg Abbott and politicians like Rick Perry and Ted Cruz have allowed it to operate under its own rules. And if this means prioritizing profit over having an energy system that's actually functional, efficient, and able to meet the needs of ordinary Texans in disaster situations, so be it. Within 24 hours of the polar vortex sweeping across the state, over 4 million people lost power in brutally cold temperatures because the equipment was literally frozen and unable to function. Neither the equipment nor the homes of millions of Texans were built to withstand this kind of weather, and it caused a near societal collapse in cities like Austin, Houston, and Dallas. David Tuttle, a research associate with the Energy Institute at the University of Texas at Austin, said in a podcast for WFAA that weatherization is supposed to happen and then it doesn't 
because it costs money. Energy companies refuse to prepare their systems for brutal conditions because they're afraid it'll harm their bottom line, even though ice storms are fairly common there. Rick Perry even had the gall to say Texans are willing to suffer to keep feds out of the power markets. Hey, Rick, let me tell you something. No, they fucking won't. You are a monstrous human being if you think Texans would willingly freeze to death in some cases so the invisible hand of the free market continues to favor the wealthy while they live in abject poverty in completely unacceptable conditions that should not be happening in the richest country in the world. But then again, this mindset reflects how those in power and those who control the power see us. Take a look at these photos taken in Houston and Dallas. Entire neighborhoods are blacked out and forced forced to stay in the cold while empty buildings belonging to wealthy business and property owners stay fully lit. It's like something straight out of a cyberpunk story and is an example of class warfare happening before our very eyes. In a stunning but not entirely surprising move, ERCOT began charging customers hundreds or even thousands of dollars in some cases more per hour because, according to a statement by the Public Utility Commission of Texas, energy prices should reflect the scarcity of the supply. The market price for the energy needed to serve load being shed in the face of scarcity should also be at its highest. This right here is them taking advantage of something called artificial scarcity, which is the intentional limiting of a resource by those in control in order to raise prices and increase profits. A common sign of late stage capitalism functioning as intended. These companies care more about profit than they do about making said resource more widely available, which means as wages remain stagnant, prices will continue to increase, directly contributing to a rise in poverty and fewer and fewer people being able to afford basic services. A Twitter user by the name of Yolian put together a thread that perfectly explains the ongoing commodification of things that should be considered basic rights, and I'll read a bit of it here. Because electricity, water, food, housing are not recognized as human rights or needs, people in power have been able to commodify it. We are conditioned to believe we are not deserving of these things. Capitalism depends on scarcity, so when it doesn't happen naturally, they have to manufacture it. For example, food, water, clothing, and other goods don't just spoil. They're actively reduced or destroyed by producers because if they just made them available to everyone, they would undercut the scarcity on which producers depend to turn a profit. This is the fundamental contradiction of capitalism. We live in the wealthiest nation in the world and literally overproduce everything, yet we're supposed to believe that natural resources are just scarce? Just because the people who privatize these resources said so? All of this comes to a head as it was discovered that the PUC intentionally shut down power plants so as to preserve their profits, literally leaving millions out in the cold, and the consequences have been unspeakably vast. Water lines are bursting and roofs are collapsing, flooding hospitals and shelters as well as people's homes and apartments, many times forcing them to flee in search of hotel rooms, some of which are going for $999 a night. Again, another example of capitalism happily taking advantage of a natural disaster at the expense of those suffering. Food supplies are running low or non-existent, leading to literal bread lines. Funny, I thought that only happened in socialist countries. Hmm. Homeless people are being left out to die as always. Remember kids, if you're not working, I mean, your labor isn't being exploited, the capitalists see you even less as a human than they already do. Elderly and disabled people who require oxygen or other services are either dying or being pushed to the precipice of death because of these power outages. Frozen bodies are already being found. Many roads are still inaccessible due to the state's lack of snow plows. What little public transit exists is stopped in its tracks Water lines and reservoirs are being contaminated, forcing cities to either issue boil notices or shut water down altogether, leading residents to have to boil snow for drinkable or potable water or have to venture out in the cold just to find their basic necessities. Not to mention, people of color have been hit even harder by this disaster in an ugly manifestation of racial capitalism. It is a disaster on a level 
I never experienced while living there. And my heart has been breaking over and over again, seeing how many millions of people are crying out for help while politicians sit back in their cushy, heated homes so they don't have to get their hands dirty. While Ted Cruz was spotted fleeing the state to take his family to Cancun. Doesn't surprise me one bit that someone as slimy as him would leave his own constituents behind. But it is funny that he issued a statement in which he said he just wanted to take his family on a vacation. Sure, Ted, we definitely can't see right through that one. But wouldn't you know it, Greg Abbott and legislatures and Fox News pundits decided to lay the blame for the state's blackouts on wind turbines. I wish I were making this up. During an interview with Fox News host Sean Hannity, who himself is a peddler of misinformation and conspiracy theories, Abbott said, This shows how the Green New Deal would be a deadly deal for the United States of America. It just shows that fossil fuel is necessary for the state of Texas. Right, because investing in more efficient energy sources and strengthening infrastructure will lead to more blackouts, power grid malfunctions, even though the current system in place is responsible for what's happening happening right now. <laughs> it is incredible to me how many people can still be duped by shit like this. Dan Crenshaw, never one to be outdone in the arena of ridiculousness, said, This is what happens when you force the grid to rely in part on wind as a power source. When weather conditions get as bad as they were this week, intermittent renewable energy like wind isn't there when you need it. Even though wind energy in Texas barely accounts for 25% of the state's output during the winter, and none of the turbines were outfitted to withstand colder temperatures. So, no shit, they're not working? If you want to throw them out because they're malfunctioning, why are you protecting the rest of the grid? Colorado Representative Lauren Boebert even made the big brain take of, the Green New Deal was just proven unsustainable as renewables are clearly unreliable. The Green New Deal hasn't been passed. Hello? And renewable energy has been shown year after year not to just be more efficient and functional than fossil fuels, but it's cheaper too? Oh wait, that's why they don't like it? Profits! I shouldn't be surprised by the gleeful ignorance of these people whose brains only go as far as their wallets and then stop. So this is already an unimaginable crisis. Politicians are defending the very thing responsible for accelerating climate change because money speaks louder than human lives and millions of innocent people are essentially cannon fodder for a dinosaur that would rather destroy everything in its path, even itself, before it lets go of that sweet, sweet cash. Our government was built to enrich the wealthy, go to war, and oppress or even wipe out all of those who stand in its way. That's it. And as you'll notice, neither party seems willing to do what's necessary to dramatically restructure both how we produce power and how we view it, all because they've worked out deals with powerful corporate entities to allow said entities to write legislation that benefits them and not the people or the planet, while the politicians' wallets are lined with dirty money from these energy and corporate conglomerates. We aren't living in a failed state because the state is doing exactly what it was designed to do. And as much as we've been led to believe it, y'all need to understand right now that voting will do jack shit to change any of this. I'm seeing lots of comments from people in Texas saying just vote your politicians out and I need to drop the truth bomb on y'all. You've been duped. This mindset that voting in two years to fix a problem happening right now, or any problem for that matter, will fix things, is the result of decade after decade of propaganda beating it into your heads that voting is the only way to truly affect change, so you have yet to wake up and see that voting is just a way to feed the two-headed beast that is the American state. Like, why do you think voting has been deemed the most important act that one can do for their country? It's all lies. We've been made to feel patriotic and proud of fueling the very thing that's killing us. And because of how convincing neoliberalism is as it defangs us and persuades us to stop thinking critically, many of you think that vague platitudes or the most minimal of actions are these society-changing steps forward. They're not. Your imagination has intentionally been restricted so it never goes beyond voting for one party 
or the other. This was all by design, y'all, and thus is the biggest challenge, in my opinion, that we currently face. Nothing will fundamentally change, as Biden once said, if we allow the continued privatization of what should be publicly owned industries and continue relying on a system that wasn't built for us and cannot be reformed by us. There is no such thing as holding politicians accountable because in America, they aren't there to be accountable to you. Period. So, what do we do? For one, if you consider yourself a devoted leftist or even a conscionable human being, stop implying that everyone in Texas is racist or a backwoods hillbilly and thus deserving of what they're suffering through. Need I remind you that millions of working class people, many of whom are people of color, are being affected by this. And if you throw one segment of society under the bus, you throw all of society under the bus. This definitely doesn't reinforce ideas of eugenics, genocide, and or white supremacy. But seriously, it doesn't matter who we think is more racist, because I can promise you people in Oregon can be just as racist as people in Texas, if not more so. Where someone was born doesn't fucking matter. We should be more focused on the socio-political forces where they live and how these forces are influencing them so as to figure out how to raise class consciousness and build solidarity with others instead of saying, you're not welcome in our spaces or, mm, we don't want your kind here. Even if you don't explicitly say it, that is what you're implying. Ever wonder why so many people from the South have expressed frustration and anger with how they're treated by lefties from other parts of the country? We should have compassion for others in society and be willing to aid them in any way that we can because it's clear as day that our government doesn't give a shit about us. After letting half a million people die from a pandemic that could have been stopped in its tracks by last summer. But no. Once again, politicians did little to nothing to stop a deadly pandemic while helping to sign weapons deals, continue killing thousands of innocent people all around the world, give millions to rich CEOs and warmongers, and be the living embodiments of the utter cruelty of capitalism. We must first abolish all forms of cruelty in our everyday behavior. Any praxis based upon dehumanization or hatred is misguided and destructive and only serves to be a stick in the wheel of progress. But that doesn't mean you have to do away with the frustration and anger you're feeling over what's happening. Harness that. Use it to educate and motivate yourself and others and utilize whatever resource you have at your fingertips to connect with the community, join political organizations like the DSA, even though, let's be honest, they've got a lot of issues of their own right now, but that's another thing to dedicate ourselves to working on. Learn theory as well so you can see the true nature of the American state, and make sure that a desire to help others and build a more compassionate society is at the heart of what you do. It's been incredibly inspiring seeing the mass mobilization of autonomous mutual aid groups across the state and how quickly they were able to bring aid to those unable to get basic necessities, take vulnerable or houseless people to shelters, and take action in a way we will never see from our elected officials. We protect us. Ordinary people like ourselves are always the first ones to do what's necessary to help others in any crisis, and we can already see the foundations of what a compassionate society run by the people and for the people without politicians or any middlemen who wield more power than us would look like. The state isn't just going to hand this to us, keep in mind. As hard as they fight us, we must be prepared to fight harder. I fully believe the seeds of something great are currently falling into place. Millions of people right now are hurting and want answers. They want justice. They know what's happening is deeply wrong, cruel, and unacceptable. We've been put through the ringer year after year after year, and after the past 13 years of presidents doing nothing to change the state of things for the better, I have to ask you, when will enough be enough. It doesn't matter who's elected to office. It doesn't matter what any politician says. This cruelty will continue unabated regardless of who is in power. The two-party system is nothing but an artifice. 
We are a one-party state controlled by a party of violence and greed. Unity, am I right? <laughs> we need something outside of that system. Not even just a third party run by workers, marginalized peoples, and all those who've suffered at the hands of the state, but something that will over time dramatically restructure society as we know it and bring all power back to the people. We may not know exactly what that is yet, but the only way we're going to find out is if we start right now. Here's to a better future for all of us.